Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to have the opportunity to say a few words at the opening of this conference. Uh, I will cover why the world should count on gas, summarizing three hard truths, three gas myths, and the triple A arguments for gas. I'm going to start with the three hard truths. First, global demand for energy will grow. Indeed, energy demand will grow by some 40% by 2030 and likely double by 2050. And to meet this will require huge investment of over $1 trillion per year globally in the total energy supply chain. The second hard truth is, and the minister uh, touched on it, Hans touched on it, whatever anyone might wish, hydrocarbons will continue as the most important source of energy to 2050 and beyond, since most of the growing energy demand will still be met by oil, gas, and indeed coal. And even in 2050, fossil fuels will still meet over 60% of global, global energy demand. But the days of easy gas and oil are over, so innovation and technology will be key to enable sustained and sufficient economic development of hydrocarbons. And this conference will very much highlight that fact. The third hard truth is that climate stress will increase. The world actually needs to halve greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 to avoid the worst effects of climate change. So the world will need twice the energy, but half the emissions. Now, there are indeed no silver bullets in reconciling economic growth uh, and climate change. But the closest thing there is, is for gas to displace coal in power generation in the next 20 years and beyond. Now, I, in saying this, like, like Hans said, I realize I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here and that most in this audience would agree. But I think we have a shared challenge, which is to convince politicians, regulators, power generators, NGOs, and consumers that we've got this right. Because many of them, many of these groups, are skeptical about gas. And to convince them, we have to overcome what I would call the three big gas myths. One, that gas supply is not secure enough. Two, that gas is only a bridging or transition fuel. And three, that gas is not really competitive. So myth one, about security of supply, and that's especially a concern in Europe. It was perhaps understandable in the past, but in my view, it's simply out of date. The key to achieving security of supply is diversification. Diversification in sources of supply, in access routes, in market players, and in commercial structures. And in fact, Europe is already well-placed in this regard. It's within economic distance of 70% of the world's gas reserves and has a well-established infrastructure of major pipelines and increasingly extensive LNG regas facilities. In fact, Europe is in the middle of a 10-year LNG growth period where the number and capacity of LNG import terminals will more than double. And this allows Europe to benefit from the North American shale gas revolution with LNG originally destined for supply to the USA, now very much focused on Europe. The second key to gas security is good internal connectivity. Hence the EU's policy requiring reversible pipelines and that all countries should have two supply routes. Gas storage is also important and Europe has 80 BCM today and 70 BCM under construction or planned today. So in short, European gas security of supply is, increasingly, is increasing rapidly. So it's surely time that energy policymakers realize that they truly can count on gas today and for decades to come. Myth two is that gas is not a destination fuel. So whilst there is an emerging realization that gas is the cheapest way to cut CO2 emissions over the next 10 to 20 years, and even organizations such as Greenpeace uh, recognize that, NGOs and politicians and regulators do still clearly worry that a stronger focus on natural gas will lock in another generation of fossil fuel plants and in some way drive out investment in renewables. I think this misses the point. 
First, the ready flexibility of gas-fired power is the natural complement to the intermittency of renewables. Second, adding carbon capture and storage to gas-fired power stations will be able to reduce CO2 emissions by some 90% at a cost that we estimate in the range 60 to $120 per tonne of CO2. This means, uh, as Hans said, that gas should be seen as a major destination fuel and a significant and reliable component of the low carbon energy system the world will need beyond 2030. The key point here is that displacing coal-fired power with natural gas will cut greenhouse gas emissions significantly and now. It will also buy society time, time for learning curves and supply chain developments in renewables, in nuclear and indeed in CCS. And in turn, this will allow a more measured and cheaper transition post-2030 to more cost-effective renewables and to large-scale CCS re retrofit to both gas and coal. Myth three is that gas will not be competitive. <coughs> gas with oil linkage in long-term contracts and price volatility are often uh, quoted as the two key concerns. Well, to me, Forecast that the role of gas will greatly reduce because it prices itself out of the market is simply not credible. With more and more gas being discovered, gas resource owners will clearly have to compete hard to win market share and to cut costs. And the shale gas revolution of North America is a great example of how technology has been applied to unlock a difficult resource and drive down costs to ensure that it is competitive. And over the next few days, we'll hear much more about the role of technology and how innovations such as floating LNG can unlock resources previously considered as stranded. As to volatility, there are many mechanisms that can give the, the buyer more price certainty if that's what they value most. But the basis for lower price and less volatility is enough supply. Major gas and LNG projects are often huge, costing billions of dollars, and require confidence that there will be a market for the product. So security of demand is what gets you security of supply and less volatility. Yes, this can be achieved through a long-term contract with an agreed price, however it's indexed. But as in the oil market, such demand for security can also be achieved through a deep, liquid traded market. The key is that supply project investors need confidence the market will be there. So government statements or policies that diminish the role of gas discourage the very investment needed to deliver competitive supplies. We need governments and regulators worldwide to acknowledge, welcome and encourage the role of gas uh, that it can play in the future energy mix. And with energy market policies that properly recognize the CO2 benefits, the flexibility, and the reliability of gas-fired power. So I want to summarize why you can count on gas with the AAA argument. It's abundant, it's acceptable, and it's affordable. So first, gas is abundant. With 250 years of global reserves now available, and still more to be found and made accessible, especially through constantly improving technology. By 2020, LNG supplies could also meet one-fifth of global gas needs, and LNG is really the ultimate flexible pipeline. It can come from almost anywhere and go to almost anywhere, so greatly mitigating security of supply concerns and over time price volatility concerns. The second A, gas is acceptable. The environmental benefits of natural gas-fired power are tangible, substantial, and immediate. It's coal-fired power growth that is responsible for the fastest increase in CO2 emissions worldwide. Actually, more than twice the CO2 rate of growth from all the world's transportation put together. Modern gas plants emit 50 to 70% less CO2 than coal plants per kilowatt hour of electricity output, and much less SOX, NOx, particulates, and heavy metals. The third A, gas is affordable. The cost competitiveness of gas is especially compelling in power generation. 
Coal-fired plants are two to three times more capital intensive than gas. Nuclear, five times more expensive. Onshore wind, seven to 10 times. Offshore wind, 10 to 15 times more expensive in capital cost terms per gigawatt than installing gas-fired power. So natural gas displacing coal is the surest, fastest, and cheapest way there is to reduce CO2 emissions over the next 10 to 20 years. In Europe, in North America, in China, in Japan, in Korea, and in just about every other country. I can highlight this with a recent study from McKinsey commissioned by the European Gas Advocacy Forum. This looks at gas displacing coal-fired power as the key route to meet the same challenging emission reduction targets for Europe as an earlier European Climate Foundation study which promoted very rapid renewables expansion with the key target being 80% CO2 reduction by 2050. Now, over the 20-year period to 2030, the estimated savings of the gas-focused approach to hitting the same CO2 targets amount to some 500 billion euros. That's enough to save every ha European household, every EU household, an average of 150 to 250 euros every year. And to help protect 20 to 25 million jobs in energy inten uh, intensive industries. What's more, there could be similar savings achieved in the period from 2030 to 2050, making for total potential savings until then of possibly up to a, a trillion euros. So in conclusion, we can and must count on gas for security of supply to help reach government emission reduction goals and for its fundamental value for money. The development of shale gas and many other innovations that are coming demonstrate that technology is the key enabler to find and develop more natural gas, even more economically, ensuring supply today and for many decades to come. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I now, like many of you, look forward to hearing the views of our distinguished panel members on the future of gas in the global energy mix, the challenges and the opportunities and as we discuss these matters, I'm sure that we're all very aware that the decisions that society and policymakers take today will have a huge impact on the lives of our children and their children. So I believe that as an industry, we should be doing a much better job in helping persuade governments and regulators to rethink gas and to set clearer expectations and policies that enable gas to play its full and deserved part as a secure, reliable, and highly competitive long-term supply source in the energy mix. This will be good for energy consumers and for power generators and for industry and for taxpayers and good for global economic growth and so for our children and good for the climate and for our grandchildren. Thank you. And it's now time to move and start the panel discussion. Thank you very much.